to Luke chapter 19. Gospel of Luke chapter 19 is where we'll be this morning. All right, Luke chapter 19, we're going to begin with verse 11. Luke 19, 11. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable, that is Jesus, because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him, and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. But then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. And likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept, put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you, because you are an austere man, you collect what you did not deposit, and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit, and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him, and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. The day of reckoning. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning. I Thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for the chance to preach it this morning. And Lord, I'm praying that you would give me what I'm supposed to say today. I, I pray, God, that you would, uh, Lord, that you'd guard my mouth, that I would say just what you want me to say and, and not say anything that I'm not supposed to. I do pray, God, for your Holy Spirit, that you would, Lord, touch every heart with the truth of your word. God, search us, convict us, Lord, lead us to you. Show us Jesus today, I pray. And it's in his name that I ask these things. Amen. The day of reckoning. So when I was a kid, I used to have this board game called the Game of Life. Now, if you're around my age, maybe you have played the Game of Life or, uh, or even had the Game of Life, but it was, it was kind of a neat little game. Uh, it was a board game, and you had... Uh, had a little spinner, and you would spin this uh, spinner, and it would, you know, you would move your little your little piece, however many spaces that you rolled or you spun on the spinner, and your playing piece was a little plastic car, and then you were supposed to put in your car. If you were a boy, you put a blue little peg in your car. If you were a girl, you put a pink peg in your car. That's back when we just had two options of of whether you were a boy or a girl. So pink or blue, that was it. And then you would, you would proceed out, and it was sort of supposed to mimic life. And so you, you had a choice of you could either go to work immediately or you could go to college. And if you went to college, you got a little bit more money, but you had to wait a little bit longer to start getting it. And you could get married along the way, and then you put, you know, another peg in there for your wife. And, and then you'd have kids, you know, and if for each kid, you know, either a boy or a girl, you'd put a little pink or blue peg in there. And and when you had, you know, sometimes you got more kids than what would fit in your car, and you just kind of crammed them in there however you could. You know, like real life. You just kind of cram them in there wherever they, you can fit them in there. And uh, if you, sometimes you'd do well and you'd make a lot of money, and 
Sometimes you'd run out of money, so you'd take a loan. But at the end of the game, when you reach the end of the board, there was this square called the Day of Reckoning. And you had to stop right there. And you had to count up everything you had, everything you owned, and then all your debt. And if you had more debt than you, than you had money to pay it or things that you own, you know, like real life, uh, then you would, uh, you would end up in the poor house. You'd have to go to the poor farm. And so you'd, you'd set your little car over at the poor farm. Or if you, if you ended up with more money than what you had bills to pay, then you could go to your country mansion and you waited till everybody else finished and then you counted up and everybody at the country mansion had to count up and see and whoever had the most money won, won the game. Well, in some ways, that's the way real life works. Not however much money you got at the end you win, but there is a day of reckoning. The Bible says that we will all stand one day before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of what we've done in this life, good or bad. Jesus tells a little parable in, in Luke chapter 19. And the context of this parable is that he's telling it because people misunderstood about the coming of the kingdom. They believed that the kingdom was coming immediately. In other words, they didn't understand that there would be a time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. They, they thought it was that, that he was immediately going to usher in the kingdom. And so he tells this parable to say, no, there's going to be a time in between my first coming and my second coming. I'm going away. I'm going to uh, receive the kingdom. And you have to be about my business while I'm gone. The king is going away. He expects you to take care of business while he's gone. That's, that's the point. Now, i got to say this. There's a lot of misapplication to this parable. People read this parable and they think it's primarily talking about money, but it's not. It is talking about stewardship, but the stewardship that he's talking about here isn't primarily talking about money, nor is it primarily talking about your talent. I've seen it applied that way. You know, that God gives you a talent, He expects you to use it. Well, that may be true, but that's not what this parable is talking about. This parable primarily in its context, is talking about the opportunity that you're given, the privilege that you're given uh, to know Jesus. It's talking about the grace that God gives us. It's talking about the light, the revelation that He gives us to know Him. It's very similar to other parables that Jesus talks about uh, being watchful and ready for His coming. He tells a lot of parables like this. So this morning we're going to look at three times that God gives every person. Three times that God gives every person. And the first time is this, a time of opportunity. God has given you a time of opportunity. Now, to understand this parable that Jesus is telling, uh, we kind of have to break down some of the pieces, uh, some of the characters in Jesus' parable to really understand uh, what, uh, what meaning he's getting at here. So he tells, he begins his parable by saying that a certain nobleman went into a far country uh, to, be, to receive a kingdom, to be appointed king. Well, it seems clear enough that the nobleman that, uh, that is to be appointed king is Jesus here. That, that's himself in the parable. Uh, and he calls his servants to himself and, and bestows on them uh, some money to, to do business while he's gone. Uh, now, the servant in the story is supposed to be you. It, it's, that, is, that, that is you. You're in Jesus' story. You are the servants. Now, there's other people in the story. He said they're citizens of the land. They hated him and didn't want him to be king. They said he won't rule over us. Well, this is Jesus' bringing out the attitude of the Jews and the religious leaders of his day that, that hated him. This is, the, this is the scribes, the Pharisees, the Jews, his own people. John says in the beginning of his gospel, he said, Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not, but to as many as did receive him, to them he gave uh, 
the, uh, the right to become children of God. So this, this is the citizens that hated him, uh, the religious leaders of his day. Now, he calls his servants, you and me, he calls them and he gives each one of them a mina. Now, a mina was worth about three months' wages in those days. So you can kind of think what you make in three months' time and you kind of got a rough idea of, of how much money we're talking about that these guys were given. It was a significant amount of money. In and of itself, it wouldn't have made it them rich. I mean, they couldn't have retired on that or anything, but it was a significant amount of money. He didn't just pull 10 bucks out of his billfold and say, here, you know, uh, be good till I get back. I mean, it was a significant amount of money. He wanted them to do business while he was gone. And he says, very, very frankly, until I come back, there's an idea that the king is returning. So in Jesus' parable, he brings out this idea of, of his coming, the, uh, the, the, the soon coming Jesus. Here seems to be the point that Jesus is getting at. Everyone is given some revelation about God. You, you are. I am. Everyone in the world. Everyone coming in the world. You can, you can read about this in the book of Romans. Paul says, you are without excuse, O man. Everyone is given some opportunity, some revelation to know Jesus. But we're not necessarily talking about people in other parts of the world that don't have a church on every street corner. We're talking about you. And we're talking about me. We're talking about us today. The king has entrusted you with the greatest gift of all, which is the ability to know him. To be a part of his kingdom. This is your opportunity. Do you treasure it? What are you doing with it? You know, here's, what, here's a great truth that I, I've learned about myself. I never seem to lose what's important to me. Now, I always, I always seem to lose something uh, when, when we move. There's three, you know, for somebody that hates to move as bad as I do, I've seemed to have done it more than anybody, but there's three, I've, I've, I've determined there's three great rules, three great principles of moving. Every time you move, you lose something, you find something, and you break something. I mean, that's just the, the, the rules of moving. And uh, the other day, we were, we were working out in the yard, and I had mowed and trimmed around, uh, trying to get ready to go on vacation. And, and uh, so there was, you know, clippings on the, uh, on the porch. So my wife, being a good wife, she comes out, and she's going to sweep off the porch. And she's got, like, her little kitchen broom, and she's sweeping. I said, I got a leaf blower in there. No, that always makes my allergies act up. So she's sweeping with her little her little kitchen broom. I said, you know, I used to have a shop broom. Um, and she said, oh, I hadn't seen that thing in years. She said, I, uh, we've lost that two or three moves ago. <laughs> and I thought, it's strange that I would what I would lose would be the shop broom, the thing that I work with. You know, the thing that, but, you know, never, never in, in 25 years of marriage have I come in and said, honey, you know, Whatever happened to that shotgun I used to have? I, you know, I, I ain't seen that. And she'd say, oh, I'd seen that in years. We lost that two or three moves ago. I, I've never once come in and said, you know, you know my guitar I used to have? I, I don't know, you know, oh, I don't know. We, it's prob we probably left that on a moving truck somewhere, and it's probably up back in Texas. No, I, I, can, I can go put my hand right now on my shotgun, my guitar, uh, things, that, things that are significant to me. Um, what I've found is that people tend to drop a faith that's lightly held. I, I know people, and I've visited with people, you know, and uh, they, you know, invite them to church or whatever. And they're like, "Well, preacher, I used to go to church, but you know, something tragedy happened in my life ten years ago, and I ain't been back to church since. I, I guess I've just lost my faith." Well, 
here, here, and I don't, I don't say this to people because I don't want to offend people, but here's the reality of it. A faith is easily dropped that's lightly held. That's the truth. It, what is important to you? I found that with very few exceptions, we tend to do what we want to do the most. If you want to, if you want to be in church, you'll find a way to get there. If you, if you want to read the Bible, you'll find time. People say, I'm just too busy to read my Bible. But yet we find time to do all the other things that are important to us. Here is the point of the parable that Jesus is making. This is your time of opportunity. He's given you this time. 70, 80 years, maybe 90 years. Maybe you don't have that long. But He's given you this opportunity to know Him. To know Him fully. What are you doing with it? The second thing I see is that everybody has this, a time of responsibility. You not only have an opportunity, but you have a responsibility. In this parable, each of the servants got the same, the same amount. They each got one mina. Which tells me this is not talking about talent, it's talking about opportunity. Because we're not, let's face it, we're not all given the same amount of talent. And certainly not in the same areas. But we all are given opportunity. And we're given this opportunity and, and, and we're told to be a good steward of it. Now, the stewardship necessitates the absence of the king. The king has to go away in order for you to demonstrate just how good of a steward you are. If the king is always right there looking over your shoulder, th then you don't have an opportunity to, uh, to exercise that what's been given to you. And so the king goes away, and when he returns, he, he meets with his servants. And the first one comes, and he says, Master, you gave me uh, one mina, and I've made ten minas. That's a thousand percent profit. That's pretty good. He says to him, the king says to him, Well, you're going to be in charge of ten cities in my kingdom. Hey, that's not a bad, that's not a bad deal. Then the second guy comes and he says, Well, you gave me one mina and I made five minas. That's a five hundred percent profit. He says, All right you're going to have five cities. The reward is disproportionate to uh, the, uh, the earnings, but it shows the king's graciousness and the love and the gracious nature of the king. And one guy goes and hides it in a handkerchief, <laughs> buries it in the ground. Now's the time to decide what you'll do with what the king has given you. He's given you this tremendous opportunity to know him and to make him known. Are you squandering that opportunity? What are you doing with that opportunity that Jesus has given you? I uh, heard a, a story about the comedian Jerry Clower. He's one of, the, one of my favorite funny guys, and uh, he said he played, back in college he played football for Mississippi State. He said they were in a football game, and they were playing Texas Tech uh, one, one Saturday afternoon, and they were just getting beat. Tech was just beating the stuffings out of them, you know, like 40 or 50 to nothing. And uh, he said, uh, he went up to the referee, and he says, ref, they're cheating. Ref says, what do you mean? He says, well, they got three footballs. He said, uh, the quarterback is handing one to the fullback. He's pitching one to the halfback. And he's keeping one and running around the end. He said, I just don't think that's very fair, ref. If you're going to give them three footballs, you ought to give us three. And the ref looked at him and said, well, son, you ain't doing too good with the one you got. Um, I think sometimes we look around at other people and how God has blessed them. And we start feeling sorry for ourselves. 
and we start the little pity party whine to God. Well, God, I just don't know why everybody else is getting blessed and I don't get anything and why aren't you good to me? And, and I just want, if you're going to bless other people, why don't you bless me and why don't you give me more and blah, blah, blah. And I, I really think the answer <laughs> that God gives us is, why don't instead of worrying about all the things that you don't have, Start doing a better job with the things that you do have. I think that's, that's the message that, uh, that this parable is teaching us. It's not about what we don't have. You, I can promise you this. God will not judge you based on what you don't have and what you don't know. You, you don't have to worry about that. What you don't have and what you don't know won't come into play on Judgment Day. But... Rather, what you do know and what you do have, that's what we'll give an account for. There will be a time of responsibility, and that time is now. What are we doing with what we've been given? And then finally, this parable makes clear, there will be a time of accountability. There will be a time of accountability. The last guy to come before the king says, Here, I've, uh, I've kept your... I've kept your coin in a, in a cloth so that I wouldn't lose it because I knew you were a mean guy, Mr. King. Uh, I knew that, I, I knew that you, you reaped what you didn't sow. I knew you collected what you didn't deposit. And so I didn't want you mad at me, so I just kept it and here it is. I was afraid of you. I feared you. I think obviously this, this servant didn't know the king or his character, that he would think that. I think there's a, there's, a, there's a reference here to how the kingdom works through us. And, and the king says, you're a wicked servant. You're out of your own mouth. I'm going to judge you. You knew I, I collected what I didn't deposit. I reaped what I didn't sow. What does that mean? That means that you and I as, as servants of the kingdom, as good stewards, ought to be sowing. We ought to be making an investment in the kingdom. That's our responsibility. We ought to be telling people about Jesus. We, we have opportunity not just to know Jesus, but to make Him known. I think sometimes we squander those opportunities as well. And then He says, all right, by your own words, you're going to be judged. Take the mina away from this guy and give it to the one that has ten. And there's a great spiritual principle here. And it's this. Those who respond to the light. Everybody's given some light. Some revelation about Jesus. Some, some way to know Jesus. And those who respond to the light, more light is given. In other words, as you follow the light to know Jesus, you get the opportunity to know Him more. But to those who reject the light, even that which they have is taken away. When you squander your opportunity to know Jesus, when you reject the light and embrace the darkness, then even that light which you have is taken away. And my friends, when we reject the light and embrace the darkness, how dark does the darkness become? Look at our world today. Things that are happening that you never would have dreamed. The wickedness in our world. And Lisa will look at me, you know, something will come on in the news and she'll say, I just can't believe that. How did this happen to our country? Well, when you, when you have people that reject the light and embrace the darkness, anything goes. He says in Jesus' parable, he says, verse 27, bring those enemies of mine who didn't want me to reign over them and slay them before me. It seems as though uh, the unfaithful servant here has, has thrown in his lot with the enemies. He squandered his, he didn't start out an enemy, but he squandered that opportunity to know the king. And so at the end, when the king returns, he's counted as an enemy. There's great spiritual truth here too. 
You don't have to be an enemy to God. But Jesus makes it clear, he who is not for me is against me. You, you have to pick a side. You're, you're either for Jesus or you're against him. You're, you're either a child of the king or, you an, or you're an enemy of the king. There is no middle ground. This is your opportunity. This is your responsibility. And there's going to come a time of accountability. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us. I will, you will, everybody. And we're, we're going to have to give an account of what we've done with what was given to us. Will you be ashamed when the king shows up? That's, that's going to be the question. Did we squander our opportunities? So, my senior year in high school, I, I had all my credit, credits to graduate, but they wouldn't let you just stay home. You know, you, you have to go and you have to stay till the end of the day. That's the way my school, May Pearl, did it. So, and it was, there was a class, I, I just, I couldn't take anything that I necessarily wanted uh, because May Pearl was a small school and they only have a few different electives to cho choose from. So my only option was art my senior year. Now, I'm not an artiste, okay? I can't, I can't draw stick figures. Some of you on Wednesday night have some, seen some of my artwork. It's not, uh, and you're probably thinking you should have paid attention more in art class, but I, uh, I didn't want to be in there. And, and to make it worse, it, it was a freshman class. So that, that's where they, they put all the freshmen in art at that time period. Well, so I'm, I'm a senior. I'm stuck in there with all these freshmen, and you know how an 18-year-old kid thinks. Uh, that's, that's just beneath me. That's, that's what I thought. This is beneath me. So I'm in there, and I'm, I'm thinking, I, I'm not an artist. I don't care anything about being an artist. I'm not, you know, not going to make my living drawing pictures. Uh, so I sit back there during the whole class, uh, during the whole semester, and me and another kid, we played paper football. Remember the, day, the old days of paper football where you, you know, you fold it up like a flag and you play paper football? And the teacher would come by every once in a while and just kind of shake her head like, Mark, you know, what are you doing? Didn't really, didn't really forbid it, just this look of disappointment. I didn't care. I didn't need the credit to graduate anyway. I was just killing time. I was playing football. And uh, so we had this semester project, all right? And, you know... You know, art teachers, art people. And if you're an art person, I'm, not, I'm really not picking on you. I'm just, but it, you, it, I want you to be creative, you know. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I want you to be creative, and I want you to create art. And I want you to, you know, you can, you, you, you can paint a picture. You can make a sculpture. You could go out in the ag shop and weld a, a, a statue, you know, uh, together. You just be creative. But this is a semester project. This is going to represent a semester's worth of work for you. And so like the last, you know, four or five weeks of class, we were all supposed to be working on our semester project. Not me. I'm sitting on the back, in the back of the room playing paper football. And the teacher would come by and once in a while said, you know, Brock, you know, our semester project's coming up. Don't you think you ought to be wearing it? Oh, I've got it taken care of. Don't worry about it. I'm playing football. And so then like, the morning that they're due, the morning that the projects are due, I get to class, and I see everybody here with their little art project, and then you know what it dawns on me? I didn't do anything for this semester project. And I thought, well, I didn't this, I mean, I could have failed and still passed. I didn't want to fail. I mean, at that point, I really didn't want to fail the class. I mean, how bad is that? I failed freshman art. I mean, that's really bad. So, so I, I run over there while... Everybody's presenting their art project. I run over there, and I get a piece of, uh, like, construction paper, you know. And I get some watercolors, and I hide in the back of the class. And I, I just start putting colors on a, on a piece of paper. And I, I put some brown, and I put some green, and I put some yellow, and I put some orange. I mean, when I was done, it looked like I had gotten sick, and my lunch was there on that paper, you know. So it come my time. I was the last one to present mine. And I got up here and I said, told the teacher, I said, all right, here it is. This is my project. She said, what is that? 
I said, it's my art project. She said, it don't look like art to me. I said, well, it's modern art. She, she, said, uh, she said, well, explain it to me. I said, well, if you'll notice all these colors on here, the browns, the greens, the yellows, they're all earth tones. This is, this is my project. I call it Smitty's Earth, you see? It's modern art. She said, this is your semester project, Smitty's Earth. I said, Smitty's Earth, that's it. She said, you want to write your title on there? Well, I was feeling kind of cocky as an 18-year-old kid. I said, sure. So I, in, big, in big letters, I wrote Smitty's Earth on there. She said, all right, now sign it because every artist has to sign his work. I said, okay. It didn't bother me. So I signed my name on there. The next week, what I didn't know, the next week was parent-teacher open house. Now, Maypearl's a small school, small town, so they do it K through 12, which means every parent of every student in the school is going to be in class, I mean, going to be at school that night, which is pretty much the whole town because, I mean, everybody had kids or grandkids. So she puts all of our semester art projects up on the wall of the hall. So everybody coming into the school has to pass right by our art projects, and mine is in the middle of the wall. I level. There's Smitty's Earth. You can see parents coming by, and they're like, what is that? Hide the kids, honey. Um, so, and I, could, and I saw her over in the corner just kind of smirking, <laughs> as if to say, yeah, Mark, you, you thought you were winning the game but I had the last word. I think for a lot of people, they think life is a game and I'm winning it. You see, I can hoodwink God. I can go through life. I can squander my opportunities. I can, I can take the, the, the light that he's given me and I can squander it. You see, the opportunities the, the chances to tell other people about Jesus, the, the chance to get to know Him more. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to read my Bible. I don't have to pray. I can, I can do what I want to, and I can, I can slough off till the last day, and then on Judgment Day, I can slide in and present Smitty's earth. Here's Smitty, here, Lord, here's Smitty's life. It's, it's a modern life. You'll love it. He's going to get the last word. The Bible is very clear. God is not, be not deceived, the Bible says, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Now that's hard language. But the good news is, you're not there yet. You see, now, you, now is the time that you have a time of opportunity. You have a time of responsibility. What, what are you doing with the opportunity that God has given you? Would you be willing today, if, this, if that day were this day, would you be willing to sign your name to your life and hand it to the King? Let's pray. God, I thank You for Your Word and how You speak to us, Lord, how You convict us, Lord. God, as we come now to a time of invitation, I pray, Lord, that You would speak to our hearts. God, I pray that You would let your Holy Spirit move us. Lead us, God, to the decisions that you'd have us to make today. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.